Okay, welcome back. Um, quick sound check. Everything okay? Great. Thank you. Um, welcome back. Today we're going to be um, finishing up the topic that we were talking about last time. Last time we were talking about combinatorial uh, approaches in chemistry. And then we'll talk a little bit about, more about uh, combinatorial approaches in biology. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. Hmm. All right. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. So, again, uh, we're here. We just completed our survey of biomolecules. I'm going to complete the topic of uh, making combina combinations of biomolecules. And then um, we'll talk about tools for chemical biology. And this is really important because these are the tools that you're going to be using when you write your proposals. So I'm glad you're all here today because um, you absolutely need to hear this to be able to write a good chemical biology proposal, which recall last time I told you was going to substitute for the um, uh, final exam in this class. There is no final exam in this class. We will not have a final. Instead, on the very last day of class, you will hand me a 10-page or so proposal, written proposal, with figures, and um, it will be an original idea, something that no one on the planet has thought of before. You will be the first, and um, it's going to be really fun because uh, it's really great to come up with creative ideas, and that's really the ultimate goal of science. Um, science is really a creative enterprise. Our goals are to invent new concepts, to tell people new visions of the universe, and to do this we have to uh, somehow invent these new uh, experiments to do. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you today about the tools in your toolkit that you're going to be using to do this assignment. Um, okay, I already talked about these announcements. I'm skipping some stuff. Oh. Um, office hours. I had office hours yesterday that got derailed by a student emergency and I know at least one of you sent me an email about that. I apologize. Um, I will have office hours today and um, in addition uh, I sent an email back to that student. So I apologize if you came by yesterday. There was a student health emergency that absolutely needed my attention and so I had to close my door to deal with that. Okay, so apologies there. Um, other office hours. Tomorrow, uh, Miriam will have her office hour on Friday, and I'm hoping Krithika will be back next week, and I'll introduce you to our chill out office hours next Tuesday. Okay, so. All right, any questions about any of the announcements, things like that, things that we talked about last time? Questions about the course structure? Oh, I got uh, an email from someone, and I apologize for not replying. Um, the email was, when are you going to post online the, uh, the slides that I'm flicking through? And the answer is, I'm going to try to get to that today. And then my plan is to basically post all of my slides from, pre from the previous year. And so that way then at least you'll have a guideline for what the slides will look like. Chances are I'll heavily modify these or slightly modify these depending on um, how much time I have before each lecture. I mean, literally five minutes before the lecture, I was making changes to the slides. It's almost impossible to stop me from doing that. I just love this so much. Um, so uh, because of that, I'll be posting uh, kind of a guideline for what the slides will look like in advance. And then I'll come back with something that's more definitive. Okay, so at the end of today's lecture, then I'll post all of the week one slides in a definitive way. But I'm also going to post uh, last year's week two, week three, week four, et cetera. Okay, sound good? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, great. Um, okay, so let me review what we talked about last time. If there are no questions about any announcements, things like that, we're going to go straight into the material. Okay, good. So um, what we talked about last time was the definition of chemical biology. Chemical biology uses techniques from chemistry, often new techniques from chemistry, often techniques that have been invented uh, specifically to answer problems of biology, but not always. Um, and then these techniques from chemistry are used to address understanding biological systems at the level of atoms and bonds. That's the goal of chemical biology, to really understand how organisms are living, how they do the things they do at the level of atoms and bonds. 
Okay, so I'm really fascinated to know um, about that hydroxide functional group that donates a key hydrogen bond or provides uh, a key um, uh, Bronsted uh, acid to um, some uh, mechanism in an enzyme active site. That's the part that makes me run to work, the sort of the details of this. I basically want to use the arrow pushing that you learned in sophomore organic chemistry to explain biology. And that's the goal of this class. And that's the definition of chemical biology. So um, last time, we learned about two key principles that organize biology. The first of these is a central dogma, which provides the roadmap for all biosynthesis taking place inside the cell. Everything that the cell has to synthesize will flow through this central dogma. This is the flow of information for biosynthesis by the cell. So everything that your cells will synthesize is going to be encoded in some way by the DNA inside your cells. Oh, and can I ask you if you have an empty seat next to you to move over to the right, just to open up some, some seats on the edges? Some people I know are coming in from other classes. So, um, you know, so other classes that are ending about, uh, about when our class is starting. So if you have an empty seat on your right, if you could just scooch over and leave seats on the edge, that would be really appreciated. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the second key um, principle that we discussed was evolution. Evolution provides a principle that um, helps us organize vast amounts of knowledge and makes, uh, and really in the end, simplifies biology enormously. Um, and it's actually a principle that all of you are going to be applying when you um, design your chemical biology experiments. Because I will tell you in advance that I will not accept any proposals that involve experiments on humans. Okay? So experimenting on humans is its own special topic that I can actually teach a whole quarter on. Okay? It requires ethical considerations. It requires tremendous design considerations. It's non-trivial to sample, for example, a diverse population of humans and ensure that you're getting diversity. So all of those considerations are beyond the realm of this class. So instead, what I'm going to ask you to do is experiment on non-human organisms. You might, for example, choose cells from humans or you might choose model organisms. And by choosing those model organisms, you're applying a key principle from evolution, which is that that model organism descended from some common ancestor that we share, and in doing so, um, acquired the same mechanisms that govern its chemistry and its chemical biology. And so that means if we learn something about this model organism, we can then apply that knowledge to understanding how humans work. Now, naturally, there's limits to this. Right? If your model organism is a salamander and you're interested in understanding how the salamander regenerates its arms when you cut them off, which incidentally would be an absolutely fascinating topic for a proposal, right? Um, there's a limit to how much analogy you can do back to humans, right? We humans don't have that same mechanism, obviously. And um, it would be absolutely fascinating for me to learn from you how it is that you plan to uh, apply the biochemistry that you're learning about stem cell growth to develop, say, limb regeneration in humans. I would love to learn that, okay? Um, okay, so evolution is important to us because it, provide, it tells us that fundamental processes are more or less the same for every organism on the planet. And I'll be showing you a few examples um, in the next few weeks that uh, illustrate this uh, universality of chemical mechanisms. In addition, we also saw that evolution is, is really a tool by which we can evolve molecules to do powerful stuff for us inside the laboratory. And I want to pick that topic up for us uh, today. OK, so I'm going to start there. Um, any questions about anything that we saw on Tuesday? OK, now I also got some really fascinating emails um, from some virologists in the audience who uh, pointed out there's actually a picornavirus protein that is known to start with an RNA template and then uh, replicate RNA. And that's absolutely fascinating. I wasn't aware of that. So there are exceptions to what I'm teaching you. I'm going to try to teach you the sort of most general thing. And yes, the there will be exceptions. Don't hesitate to point them out to me. I'm fascinated by those exceptions too. 
OK. So um, let's pick up where, uh, OK, before we do, um, last thought about this proposal assignment. Um, to do the proposal successfully, um, what you have to do is you have to come up with a novel idea. Okay? I will not accept any proposals that don't have something new in them. Okay? And I will actually uh, ask the TAs to do Google searches and, um, and literature searches and PubMed and other sources to verify that what you're proposing to do has not been done before. Okay? So you have to come up with a creative new idea. This sounds daunting, but let me um, provide some guidelines on how to do this. Okay, so the first thing that you need um, it are a series of experimental tools and then knowledge of the problem. Okay, so experimental tools I'm going to provide you today. I'm going to give you a toolkit by which you can go out and start to address problems in chemical biology. The second portion, knowledge of the problem. You need to know that actually, you know, there's a key step in limb regeneration that's not so well understood. That second step comes from reading the literature, okay? And the first assignment in this class, the journal, journal, article, book, uh, journal article report, is designed to help you address this second thing, knowledge of problems, okay? So in doing the assignments that are required for the class, these two things are going to come together. Okay, today we're going to address number one, and then item number two you're going to get by Valentine's Day, February 14th, you'll have uh, a journal article report, and then in doing this assignment, you'll be looking at the literature and you'll start to identify problems in the field that interests you. Okay, so you'll choose a journal article that's relevant to your interests. I don't know what your interests are. Let's say you want to be a dermatologist. Okay? Maybe you'll find a chemical biology report that uh, uses skin cells and looks at, say, melanoma development in uh, skin cells and looks at it at the level of atoms and bonds. Um, I would love to hear more about that. And then by doing this assignment, you'll start to know what are the big unknowns in uh, skin cell tumor development. Okay? What are the things that people are fascinated by that are, uh, they're designing experiments to address? And you'll have the tools from this lecture that will allow you to address those problems. Okay? Sound good? Okay. Um, so uh, how to find the problem. The first thing I need to ask you to do is start reading either science or nature. Okay? So um, I assume many of you are science majors. If you're not a science major, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, you're a fascinating case. I'd like to talk to you later. So come to my office hours, introduce yourself. All right, so everyone else is a science major. You're going to get, uh, to get a degree in science. I'd like you to read either science or nature pretty much for the rest of your life. Pick one. You don't have to read them both. And furthermore, you don't have to read them all that carefully. Just skim through them. By doing that, you will be an informed citizen. Okay? You will know more about science than 99.99% of the people on this planet. And furthermore, you'll learn something about what's really cutting edge. Okay, you only have to spend 10 or 15 minutes flipping through science or nature, just looking at the headlines and seeing, oh, they discovered a new class of quasars out in you know, some outer galaxy. Just doing that uh, is enough to um, help you, uh, well, certainly have much better banter at cocktail parties, let's say. Okay? And to me, that's enough. Okay? So this is part of your education. Okay? So um, start reading science or nature. Simply flip through them. That helps you um, identify problems. The second way is to look at PubMed or Medline, uh, which are the same things. And I'll be talking some more about PubMed in a, in, uh, in a future lecture. Okay? So hopefully you, al you already know what PubMed is. Hopefully you already know how to apply it. I'll be showing you how to apply it to chemical biology pro problems um, at a future lecture. But these are the two ways that you sift through the literature to find stuff that's interesting and that grabs your attention. Because in the end, you want your proposal to be about something that really interests you. Okay? You're going to spend a lot of time on this. Okay? Many, many hours. And if it's not something that totally interests you, that's not somehow related to the bigger picture of your career aspirations, it's not going to be as much fun. Okay? And in the end, if it's fun, you'll do a better job. I'll, be more, I'll get a better proposal back out of it. And that's the part that interests me. Okay, now I was reading, I chair the admissions committee in the Department of Chemistry at UC Irvine, and I was reading the um, application essays from uh, the, all the wonderful applicants who, who have applied to UC Irvine this year, and I came across this wonderful quote up here, uh, the more you know, the more questions you can ask. And so um, those questions that you can ask, those are the questions that uh, you will be um, addressing with your proposals. So our goal is to get your knowledge up to the point where you can start asking those questions. Okay? 
All right, now I know this is all very, this all seems very abstract, but it's not going to be as abstract in a moment. Okay. Sound good? Questions so far? All right, don't be too daunted by the assignment. Um, it will all come together uh, when you're ready. Okay, last announcement, uh, next week's plan. Next week, we're going to be starting on chapter two. Please skim chapter two in advance. Take a look through chapter two even before I get to it. Chapter two is a review of arrow pushing. Chapter one was a review of the biology you need to know. And next week, we'll be talking about arrow pushing and mechanistic organic chemistry that you need to know to um, do chemical biology. Okay, so next week, we're going to have two lectures on uh, mechanistic arrow pushing. Now, here's the deal. I'll be out of town on Tuesday, but I've pre-recorded Tuesday's lecture. <laughs> and so I'm trying a little experiment this year. Um, I'm, I understand that the, uh, the video from uh, Tuesday's lecture, the last Tuesday's lecture, is already available and is going to be uh, shortly posted online. Okay, so I will send you the link to uh, last tu Tuesday's lecture and at the same time I'll send you the link to the next Tuesday's lecture. Okay, and so that next Tuesday's lecture then you can watch in your pajamas in the comfort of your, uh, your dorm room. Okay, and so um, we're going to try that for Tuesday's lecture. I think that's actually, I think that will work, um, but I'll know very quickly if it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so, and then Thursday I'll be back. So Tuesday I'll be at Cal State LA giving a seminar. Thursday though I'll be back. Okay, sound good? Okay, um, all right. Uh, so that's the next week's plan. We're going to be reviewing important stuff from organic chemistry. Mainly this focuses on structure and reactivity of carbonyls. If you are weak in 51C, please reread this chapter on carbonyl reactivity, structure, things like that. There might be two or three chapters for you to read. Um, mechanisms involving carbonyls, especially the aldol reaction. 90% of carbon-carbon bonds in chemical biology are made using an aldol reaction. You need to know what an aldol reaction is. Okay, if this word aldol is totally unfamiliar to you, then um, you need to spend a little bit of time this weekend reading about it, getting familiar with it again. Okay, because I'm going to assume that you know about an aldol reaction when we get to it. Okay? Now, on the other hand, in your review of uh, sophomore organic chemistry, don't get worked up about reactions for the synthesis of carbonyl containing compounds. Anything that you learned in uh, 51C about how to make a carbonyl using PCC um, is more or less worthless for this class, okay? Because PCC is not found in cells. It's totally toxic. And so, um, uh, good news, uh, as you're skimming through, as you're reviewing, uh, if necessary, don't get too worked up about memorizing a bunch of name reactions and stuff like that, okay? Instead, focus on mechanisms, focus on the reactivity, understand how carbonyls work, that sort of thing. That's what you really need to know going into the next few weeks of this class. Okay. That was a long set of uh, announcements, but thanks all everyone for coming out for that. All right, let's get started on the actual, the new material. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, combinatorial uh, approaches first, and I'm going to pick up on the last slide that I showed you last time and uh, make sure that I didn't skim through it so quickly that it didn't make any sense to you, and then we'll go on to the next topic. Okay, so last time, whoops. I was talking about modular architecture in organic synthesis. This is a, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Just give me one moment to figure this out. All right, I guess we'll have to live with this. Okay, so um, modular architecture is a design principle that allows you to synthesize compounds in a way that uh, allows access to combinatorial libraries. And last time we talked about this principle of combinatorial libraries. Combinatorial libraries are big collections of different molecules. And in a combinatorial library, you have a different set of modules that are shuffled around and recombined in a way that makes a whole series of different molecules. Okay, and we talked uh, last time about this class of compounds called benzodiazepine. This name should be, the name of this class of compound should be vaguely familiar to you. This is an important class of compounds that's found almost ubiquitously in medicinal chemistry and uh, they're used for, amongst other things, uh, antidepressants. Um, so you can make a combinatorial library of, of, of based upon this benzodiazepine scaffold 
by varying the R functionality shown here. And you can do this by a very straightforward synthetic plan that involves the recombination of a, al uh, of a, um, a ketone together with an aniline. So this is a compound that has both a ketone and an aniline functionality together with an, uh, some sort of alkyl halide and an acid, let's just say uh, acid halide and an amine. And so these will all snap together to give you this benzodiazepine framework. I'm not showing you the mechanism for this and it's not so important for our discussion so we're going to skip over it. But you can imagine having say, um, you know, 20 different versions of this ketone based compound with different R1s and different R2s, 20 R3s over here, or 20 uh, compounds that have different R3s and then say 25 compounds that have different R4s. When you put these all together and you would do this in individual reaction flasks, you'll end up with a large number of different compounds. Okay, so let's just do 20, 20, 20. Okay, so 20 of these, 20 of these, 20 of these. Um, if we make all possible combinations of those, how many compounds will we end up with? How many benzodiazepines? Twenty times twenty times twenty. Twenty to the third, which is eight thousand. Thank you. Okay, you guys are scaring me now. Um, okay, so eight thousand compounds can very readily be synthesized by starting with uh, simply sixty different uh, precursor compounds. And that's pretty powerful. If you have 8,000 different benzodiazepines, each one that is potentially some bioactivity, then um, that collection could have a lot of very powerful um, new therapeutic compounds in it, for example. Okay, and then we talked about some other different modular frameworks that can be used. Now, I want to shift gears. That's the example of using uh, combinatorial chemistry in uh, the synthetic laboratory. This principle, of course, borrows heavily from biology and it turns out that your immune system uses a similar principle to develop uh, diverse molecules called antibodies, which are one of the first lines of defense against uh, foreign invaders. Okay, so um, if, heaven forbid, you decided to um, pick the apple up off the ground over there and uh, start chewing away on it, um, you would find a lot of foreign bacteria in that apple. And so um, likely, likely um, antibodies would play some role in fighting off those foreign bacteria. Okay, so here's the way this works. So antibodies' job is to be binding proteins. Their job is to grab on to non-self molecules. So I'm going to refer to this class of compounds as professional binding proteins. That's what they do for a living, okay? That's their, their profession. And um, it's one of the immune system's first lines of defense. Structurally, they look like this. I told you uh, earlier um, one convention for looking at protein structures look, uh, using a ribbon to trace out the backbone. I didn't tell you really what these arrows mean um, and these curly cues. We'll get to that later. But a different convention for looking at protein structures just maps a surface onto the outside of the protein structure. Okay, so if you were able to have, you know, special electron microscopy eyes, you know, eyes that had amazing power of resolution and vision ability, what the antibodies really would look like is something like this. Okay, so they have this sort of bumpy exterior. Now, the stuff down, uh, and um, I've colored this antibody to highlight um, its structural components. Okay, so antibodies, it turns out, are, um, are uh, composed of a total of four chains. Two of these chains are called light chains. They're shown uh, here at the, uh, at the top in green uh, and then this sort of cyan color um, and this purple color. Um, and then there's two heavy chains. Okay, the details, not so important. Don't get worked up about memorizing how many chains each protein has. Um, here's what's important. Okay, antibodies have evolved a mechanism that allows them to recognize diverse binding partners. And they do this um, by having a series of flexible loops that can accommodate different shapes that they need to bind to. Okay, so I'm um, turning now to the very tips, the tippy top of the antibody up here, which is labeled binding site. 
this is where the antibody will try to attempt to bind to that foreign invader. Let's say uh, you picked up a virus when you bit into the apple. Now the virus is floating around your bloodstream. So the antibody is going to attempt to bind to the exterior of this virus. And if we zoom in over here, this is the tippy top. This is just the, um, this is called the FAB region of the, of the antibody. So the FAB region of the antibody over here. And you can see, and then in this van der Waals spheres, this is an antibody binding to a small molecule. So it's binding to some target. The exact target, not so important for us, but notice how the target is cradled in these loops. Okay, the loops are uh, gripping this antibody very gently, but it, or sorry, they're gripping this antigen gently, but the antigen is fully buried in these loops. So these loops are flexible to accommodate many different potential binding partners. That flexibility is critical. That means they can recognize, you know, virus one or virus two, or if you go to Ethiopia and pick up some totally different virus, they will also pick that one up too, you hope. And um, at the same time, these provide enough other types of molecular recognition, which we'll talk about later, that allows strong enough binding to muster an immune response. And then the antibodies basically sound the alarm, the red coats are coming, and, and get the immune response to go into high gear to start killing off that foreign invader. Okay, so very first line of, uh, of defense against uh, foreign invaders. Now, the problem and the big challenge is that um, these antibodies need to recognize stuff that your, your, your human organism, you, have never seen in your life. Okay? That means that if you travel to India or you travel to, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Palos Verdes or wherever it is that you travel and you pick up some new organism or some new foreign invader, the antibody, the combinatorial library of antibodies needs to be ready to recognize that. And of course, um, uh, you know, this stuff has never been seen before. The antibodies have never trained on that. So the, the strategy that your immune system uses is to have a vast collection of potential binding partners. Okay, so make a big collection of different antibodies, each one with structural differences to be ready to recognize any particular um, type of invader. Okay, now here's the other thing. So the size of the collection is huge. Okay, and these antibodies are produced by immune cells called B cells, which look like this, so, um, or B lymphocytes. This collection is uh, fairly enormous. It's uh, estimated to be on the order of about 10 billion or so different antibodies. Okay, but earlier I told you that the um, human genome is only about 24,000 genes. Okay, so obviously there can't be um, 10 billion different molecules in the immune system, uh, each encoded by its own gene. So instead, the strategy that the immune system has evolved is a strategy whereby different gene segments are recombined in a way that then produces a combinatorial library of different antibodies. Okay, so let me show you. So there are 40 of these variable genes, uh, V modules, 25 diversity modules, six joining modules, and they're shown here. So here's the, the V genes, the D and the J genes. And then by combinatorial, D, combinatorial gene assembly, these are brought together to encode the antibody heavy chain gene, okay? So that encodes the heavy chain that I showed on the previous slide. Similarly, the light chains are produced by another type of combinatorial gene assembly whereby one of these V's is picked out and et cetera, and one of the D's is picked out, et cetera. Okay? So in doing this, you can get a very vast library of different antibodies. Furthermore, the antibody diversity pool is further diversified by um, a series of um, genetic manipulations that uh, includes um, variable gene joining. So when the genes are joined together, they're not sort of glued together neatly. Instead, there's little parts that are clipped off or added in. And then furthermore, there's a process called hypermutation that goes through and um, makes tiny little mutations in the encoding sequences as well. So in the end, you end up with around 10 billion or so different antibodies, each one different structurally and potentially able to recognize whatever foreign invader you happen to counter during your life. Okay, make sense? 
Okay, so to summarize, what we're seeing is a strategy for combinatorial synthesis that's used in the laboratory and also used by your uh, cells. Okay, in both cases, there are these modules that are shuffled around and then rejoined um, in literally random fashion to give us a vast collection of different molecules. And then we hope that these different molecules are going to be functional when the time comes that we actually need them. Okay, make sense? Okay, yeah, question so over here. Diversity in the mutations, that what causes autoimmune diseases because there's so many of them and then it'll sometimes react then against us because there's so many? Okay, yeah, so there's a separate process that subtracts out things that recognize self okay. as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question as well. Okay. So, yeah, thanks for asking. What is your name? Joshua. Joshua, okay. Okay, changing gears. Um, so the last topic in chapter one uh, is a survey of the tools that we need in chemical biology to be able to address problems and address the frontiers of chemical biology. So I'm going to have a very quick survey in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. I'm going to share with you um, a series of different uh, uh, tools that you can then use in your proposals. Okay, so think of this as you're trying to put together your toolkit. Um, this is going to be the hammer, the saw, the um, nail gun, whatever. Okay, so these are the things that you need to um, put to address, uh, to design experiments in chemical biology. Okay, so again, this is useful for planning your proposal assignments, um, but this also provides a toolkit for further experiments. We're going to be referring to this toolkit quite a bit in this class. So later in the quarter, I'll be able to say, oh yeah, you remember those antibodies that I mentioned earlier? Um, those are now going to be in your toolkit. Okay. Um, this toolkit is very diverse and vast. Um, it ranges from uh, chemical reagents to entire model organisms. And there's a huge amount of diversity um, in, the, in, that, uh, in that range of different uh, tools. So chemical biology as a field uses all kinds of different techniques. Uh, it uses techniques from molecular biology. It uses techniques from the very latest in nonlinear optics um, to image cells um, and everything in between. Okay, in addition, I also want you to know these tools because I want you to be able to design experiments on the fly to determine, you know, X. Okay, and a very common midterm question for me would be, how would you design an experiment to address, you know, what, um, what kind of uh, signaling, uh, chemical signaling is being used by the gut bacteria, your gut bacteria to, um, to uh, let, let, them, uh, let their neighbors know that sugar has arrived, okay? Which is actually, is actually a pretty interesting question. I'd like to know how do you, you do that. Um, okay, in addition, I want you to know how to describe negative and positive controls. We're going to be talking about experiments and all good experiments have both negative and positive controls. So why don't we talk about that topic first? Okay, so if you're going to be designing experiments, you need to know first what a negative control is and what a positive control is because you need to be able to design these into any experiment that you want to design. Okay, so good experiments have both a positive and a negative control. Positive control first. A positive control is a set of experimental conditions that provide an expected res response or a positive result. Okay, so in this case, you could basically want to know, does the conditions in my uh, flask uh, produce, um, uh, you know, pr uh, produce say amplified DNA or something like that? And so what you'll do is you'll start with a um, sample that you know should work a certain way in your experiment, okay? It should give you a predetermined result and it should be completely consistent every time. It should be uh, very, it should give you that expected result every time. So this tells us that our experimental apparatus is working. Okay, and you need to know this because um, oftentimes the experimental apparatus in chemical biology labs isn't simply a stir and, you know, a hot plate where you can just test the hot plate by sticking your fingers on it for a nanosecond. Um, the chemical apparatus might be, you know, a tiny little micro, uh, micro centrifuge tube and you've, been, you've shot in a bunch of uh, different reagents, you know, 10 different reagents, all of which are clear, none of which you can really uh, assay all that readily. So what you do is you set up a set of conditions where you know the result 
and then you see if that the result is recapitulated under your experimental conditions. Okay, so this is the positive control and you always want to have one of these. Good experiments have positive controls. Good experiments also have negative controls. So this is where you leave out some experimental condition in your experiment. Maybe you leave out the test sample. Okay, so um, earlier I was talking to you about um, trying to assay, uh, let's just say, um, some sort of microorganism found in your stomach that uh, responds to the presence of sugar. Okay, and maybe you want to know um, whether that uh, microorganism releases indole to signal to its neighbors. Okay, actually that's not a bad experiment. So um, your experiment, your experimental apparatus will be measuring the concentration of indole your positive control will be, say, some bacteria that you know releases indole, and that tells you whether or not your experiment is working. The negative control can be entirely missing the bacteria. Okay, so you do the exact same experiment, but you leave out the bacteria, and no indole should result. Okay, if you see indole resulting, that tells you that you have a problem. That tells you that um, you have, a, a, say, a contaminant, for example. This should result in a failed experiment or a negative result. So it's experimental condition missing a key element, say the test sample, the thing that you're trying to test. Okay? And again, it should result in a failed experiment. If it does not result in a failed experiment, that tells you that in your conditions you have some sort of source of contamination. You absolutely need these negative controls. Okay, because all too often in chemical biology, we have lots and lots of contaminants. And there are lots and lots of false positives, and we just don't like that kind of thing. You want to know that if you're going to tell your friends down the hall that you discovered um, a new base in, in the DNA sequence, um, you want to know that actually that's the real thing. Okay, that you're not uh, telling uh, your good friend uh, something that turns out to be totally wrong later. And it makes you look stupid, because no one likes to look stupid. Okay. Now, um, because we have very complicated experiments in chemical biology that involve lots and lots of variables. You remember I told you earlier about the one that has 10 different things thrown into a little tiny uh, micro centrifuge tube. We often have multiple negative controls, one for each possible variable. Okay, so for example, you might leave out the magnesium from the buffer just to know does the magnesium contribute to this experimental result? You know, is this actually a magnesium dependent enzyme that produces the indole as expected? If you, add, if you leave out the magnesium and you still are getting some result that could tell you that maybe it's not a magnesium dependent process. Okay, so negative controls um, tell you a lot about what's going on in your experiments. Okay, and a good experiment should have both negative and positive controls. Any questions about what positive controls are, what negative controls are? Yeah. So if you, if you like, uh, if you fail a positive control, and you pass a negative control, you can modify OK. This is a great question. And it happens to be all the time. OK. So the question, what is your name? Uh, B. B? Yeah. B. OK. So B's question is, if your positive control fails and your negative control works, what does that tell you about the experiment? I would say that that tells you that your experimental conditions are worthless and you cannot interpret the experiment. Okay? Because if the positive control fails to work, then you really don't understand what's going on in your experimental condition. Okay? The positive control really tells you whether or not you understand all of the elements that compose your experiment. If the negative control fails as you expected it to fail, well, maybe it's failing because the positive, for the same reason that the positive control failed. Maybe you've left out some key reagent, right? You know, maybe uh, you didn't heat it up to the right temperature and hold it there for long enough or something. Okay? So both your positive control and your negative control have to work in order for you to interpret the results. Okay, now I'm being really dogmatic here. I will tell you, um, I will tell you that we scientists oftentimes look at experiments that don't necessarily have um, every control working. Okay, I'll, I'll look at those. My students will show me those all the time. I'll look at them. 
Um, but I'm not going to, you know, call up the, um, you know, the Nobel Prize Committee in Stockholm and tell them about it, okay? Because um, it's probably not uh, worth a lot of time. But we'll use that to guide the next set of experiments. We'll say, well, what is it that the failed in the positive control? And then we'll, we'll design and troubleshoot and design the next experiment using that information. We'll look at the negative control, say, oh, yeah, that failed, that failed, that failed. So these variables are probably okay. What about this one? Okay. So you can get a lot of information from experiments that fail. In fact, you absolutely, to be a successful scientist, you need to learn how to work with experiments that fail because 90% of the time they fail. Okay. But, you know, that's the way life is. So um, you learn as much as you possibly can and then you move on. But what, to, to make strong conclusions, though, you need experiments where both the positive control and the negative control are working as expected. Okay. Okay. Good question. B, other questions? All right. Um, let me show you an example. Let's imagine that you wanted to amplify um, some DNA sequence using a technique called PCR. Details, not so important now. Hopefully you already know what PCR is. I understand it's taught in high schools now. If not, you can look it up in the textbook. Um, if not, don't stress about it. I'll talk about PCR later. Um, later, you'll need to know how this works. For now, let's just use it as a, a method for amplifying DNA. Okay, and furthermore, here's a method for visualizing DNA as bands on a gel. And I know all of you have done TLC. This is kind of like TLC, except the um, bands are upside down. Okay, but it's more or less, it's like upside down TLC. It's more or less the same technique that's used to visualize compounds, except we're visualizing DNA by running it through an agarose gel. Again, if that technique is not familiar to you, don't panic. We'll talk about that later in this class. Um, for now, we have a method for amplifying DNA. We have a method for visualizing the resultant DNA. Okay? Now, here's our positive control. It's the lane over here that's labeled with a plus. Okay? So over here is a set of conditions that you know results in DNA. And notice that there is a band right here, big bright band. Okay, so that tells us that our positive control works. You have a sample of DNA that you know should amplify under that set of conditions, and lo and behold, it gives you that nice bright band. Next lane. The next lane are the negative controls. Okay, so we don't see that same band. Um, say that is missing the DNA sample. Okay, we don't see that same band, so we don't have to get worried about it. Um, final uh, lane. This is our experimental lane. Okay, you do these two experiments, the positive and the negative control, just to see whether your sample over here is working. Okay, and here's the one that has the actual test sample. And notice that it gives you DNA, and it turns out this technique separates on the basis of size. It gives you DNA of a different size. Okay, so we have both a positive control that works as expected. We have a negative control that uh, works as expected. And then we have our experimental exper uh, one. In um, a typical experiment in my lab, we'll have six or seven negative controls and maybe two positive controls just so that we know what's going on. We, don't, we cannot visualize what's going on, so we need all of these controls to um, follow what's actually happening in the, in the test tubes, okay? or sometimes even smaller than test tubes. Okay? Sometimes we're even down at a single molecule level, so we really, really need all these controls. Okay? I want you to be thinking about these controls when you design your proposals. Okay, good proposals will have both positive and negative controls. How you design your experiments and how you discuss them with me um, will in the end determine how creative they are and how, and how robust they are and how likely they are to stand up to scrutiny. Okay, if you want to propose something that's totally wild, like, I don't know, time travel or something like that, um, I will discourage you. But let's say you want to propose something that's not quite so wild. Okay, but you come up with a whole bunch of controls that will really tell us something in, uh, about whether or not your experiment is working, I'll go with it. Okay? So um, be as creative as you possibly can be. Okay? I'll look forward to reading those. All right, um, let's talk about tools. So the first tool that's used quite extensively in chemical biology laboratory involves dyes that are turned over. These are um, these color metric indicators as they're uh, as they're uh, termed, um, have been used for hundreds of years, 
probably at least 120 years um, in chemical biology experiments. Okay, they're used for all kinds of things. They're used to stain cells, they're used to um, follow enzyme reactions, and um, here is one example of these uh, dyes. If you have some sort of enzyme in your reaction that you're trying to um, assay and the enzyme somehow cleaves this um, ether bond, um, what will happen is this will then release a, phenol a nitrophenolate uh, molecule shown here. This nitrophenolate is a nice yellow color. Okay, so you can very clearly see this one is clear, this one is yellow. Okay, so everyone can see that difference? Okay, so if enzyme is present and enzyme is functional, you get a nice yellow color from uh, the, uh, the, um, from this, uh, the solution. Okay, now, um, this, uh, this is really powerful. Okay, this gives you a way of turning stuff that you can't see into stuff that you could then visualize. Okay, and furthermore, this is typically quantitative. In other words, you could pass uh, light through here, see how much light gets absorbed. Say you pass um, visible light through here, see how much light gets absorbed and use this to quantify how much enzyme is present in your uh, solution. Okay, doing this gives you a really effective way at addressing things like enzyme kinetics, at um, you know, different properties. Uh, you can look at, uh, say, binding between receptors and ligands using this type of technique. So this is bread and butter of chemical biology labs. Okay, B, you have another question? Okay, yeah, so um, B's question is, how do I know the concentration of the enzyme uh, in this reaction? How do you make it quantitative? Okay, so what you will do is you'll have a series of controls where you have a known amount of enzyme that's turning over this dye, and then you see how yellow it gets after five minutes with that known quantity of, of uh, enzyme. Okay, and then you could use that to calibrate this experiment. Okay, so yeah, so there's subtleties to everything I'm telling you, but this isn't too hard. Thanks for asking. Other questions? Okay, so in this example, we're looking at um, light that's absorbed and then um, it, this absorbance results in the uh, molecule radiating out the energy that's the, of the photons that it's absorbing as heat. Okay, in a different experiment, the light is absorbed and instead of the energy of the photons being radiated out as heat, instead it's blasted out by the, the molecule as a, a photon with a lower energy. Okay, so it has a, a different wavelength of light that's being given off. Okay, so here's a series of different molecules that um, have that property in that they absorb photons and then radiate back out photons of lower energy. These are used in fluorescence experiments extensively in chemical biology. These are used to visualize molecules inside cells, inside organisms, um, and in a ho whole host of different experiments. Okay, so I already told you this, fluorophores absorb photons of light and emit a photon at a lower wavelength. Okay. Um, you can select uh, in your, mi in your uh, microscope just those photons at that lower wavelength by setting up a filter. Okay. So the way this works is if your um, fluorophore, um, let's say this uh, fluorescein over here. So here's your fluorophore. It's going to give you this greenish colored light. And in your microscope, you will have a filter that filters out all other light. Okay, so this prevents backscatter, except for light of this wavelength that is this nice green color. That will give you um, exactly where this fluorescein molecule is binding inside the cell. Okay? Furthermore, this technique is extraordinarily sensitive. It's one of our most sensitive techniques in chemical biology, um, supplanted only by the thing that Miriam is working on. Okay, so Miriam is doing something that's going to be even better. But um, for now, uh, up until say two years ago, this was the, the champ. And um, you can get down to single molecules under the right conditions using fluorescence. You can actually see one fluorophore uh, fluttering away as it's releasing photons. Okay, pretty amazing. 
Okay? I will tell you that uh, those right conditions, completely non-trivial. Okay? It takes a cooled um, CCD camera that's very, very large and very expensive. This is not like your, your cell phone that's hooked up to the top of the, uh, the microscope. This is a really kind of a very special type of camera to visualize this sort of thing and pull up enough photons. But in the end, this is really powerful stuff because you can visualize just one molecule inside the cell, then you could start getting at processes that, uh, that really govern how cells work, where cells are oftentimes um, responding to a low number of molecules inside them. Okay? So this is a really powerful technique. It's used for all kinds of things. In this example, I'm showing you two cells that are dividing and they're being pulled apart by these spindles up over here. Uh, uh, sorry, the DNA in blue is being, or in cyan, is being pulled apart by the spindle apparatus into the two daughter cells. And the actin, which is the, the, the protein scaffold of the, the cell, kind of the, the skeleton of the cell, is, is highlighted in red over here. Okay, absolutely spectacular, stunning imagery, really, um, that you can find uh, examples of uh, where this technique is used. This is completely ubiquitous. This technique is used for visualizing stuff inside the cell. It's used for visualizing stuff outside the cell in uh, little tiny reaction flasks for doing screens of drugs, um, for doing phenotypic uh, assays of cells as well. Okay, and question over here. Uh, yeah, so the single molecule technique that I described uh, would use a FRET. So, thanks for asking. Um, other uh, questions? Yes, over here. And what is, what is your name? What is your name? Um, Chelsea. Chelsea. So basically these small molecules are made so they can bind to a specific part of the cell. Ooh, Chelsea's question is a really good one. Okay, so Chelsea's asking, you know, why should you know, this dye bind to the DNA over here and nowhere else inside the cell. Later we'll be talking about the dyes that bind to DNA and what makes them special. But you're absolutely right, they need some way of getting guided into the cell. So for example, these actin, uh, the, the red color of the actin, I believe is an antibody that binds to actin. Okay, so that's that big molecule that I showed earlier. That antibody is then attached to this rhodamine. Okay, so rhodamine is attached to the antibody. The antibody that's being used is specific for actin. It binds to actin. It's a professional binding protein that was raised just to bind to actin. And now it's going to highlight all of the actin in the cell in this rhodamine uh, red color over here. Okay, really cool stuff. So thanks for asking. But you have to have some other technique that will target the fluorophore specifically to what it is that you're lighting up inside the cell. Okay, great question, Chelsea. Other questions? Okay, so again, totally ubiquitous technique, used very extensively. I imagine every single one of you will have some experiment in mind that will use either fluorescence assays or uh, colorimetric assays of your molecules. Okay, now here's the deal. We can expand these up. I've shown you two different assays. We can expand these up to look at literally thousands of molecules a day and thousands of conditions a day using, um, uh, uh, using for example, micro titer plates. Okay, so these are plates that are about this big. So they're not that big and they're standardized and they have a standard number of wells on them. So the ones my lab uses are 96 or sometimes 384 wells per plate that's this big. But it's not unusual to have wells, to have 1,536 wells in a little space that's about this big. Okay, where each well is, you know, say 10 microliters or something like that. Okay, but that, what that means then is on that plate you can assay 1536 different conditions. Okay, so that's 1,500 different conditions. Okay, maybe 50 of those are different controls, negative controls, positive controls, but you're still looking at a huge number of different molecules, of different uh, uh, other variables that you're testing in that one little tiny area. And um, it's not infrequent to, for me to visit places where they have a whole room this size filled with robots that are um, pipetting that, that's this technique over here, pipetting in an automated fashion reagents into these tiny little uh, plates. And then the robot has like a little, you know, arm that then brings it into a reader and the absorbance is then read out automatically. And all this data is then ported to your desk um, and appears on your laptop. Okay. Very cool, isn't it? Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great time to be alive. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, 
This absorbance, we talked earlier how it can be used for quantitative analysis. Oftentimes we rely on antibodies to bind with specificity to a particular molecule. This is the question that Chelsea was asking. It's not unusual for us to actually um, add an antibody that's specific for some target inside the cell. Okay, and so we're doing this so that we can actually look at just that individual protein. And I showed you earlier the structure of antibodies. That structure allows them to be very, very specific. Um, if the antibody is attached to an enzyme, then you can look at turnover of a dye and that can, uh, that can, be, that can visualize the presence of a molecule as turnover of a dye. Okay, everyone still with me? Make sense? Okay, and the scope of this is enormous. Um, pharmaceutical companies will screen through half a million compounds in two weeks using techniques like this one. Okay, and there might be two humans that are involved in those experiments, both of whom are keeping the reagents and the robot happy. Okay, turns out actually programming the robot, not as trivial. So, you know, it's very different than telling the undergraduates, okay, I want you to pipe out all these things. Okay, this is much more industrial scale. Okay, and it's used very routinely in chem bio labs. Okay, sound good? All right, let's move on. Um, another very powerful technique um, that's used quite routinely is basically a Darwinian evolution technique where you can evolve organisms that um, can accomplish some chemical goal. For example, over here, this is um, an experiment to find mutant bacteria that can take advantage of iron and metabolize this iron. So in this plate over here, this left side are, is the negative control. These are bacteria that you don't expect that were not mutated. And on the right side, so you do not expect them to be able to handle the iron. And on the right side, these little little circles are examples of the colonies of bacteria that can take advantage of the iron and actually accomplish their metabolism. On the right side, here's in B, panel B, this is a different uh, experiment where you're looking for bacteria colonies that can produce lycopene. Lycopene is the red dye that's found in um, tomatoes. It's the reason why tomatoes are red. And it also is thought to have some anti-cancer properties, although that evidence for that is not as well supported. But in any case, you can imagine evolving the bacteria, um, putting in the genes that encode lycopene uh, production, and then evolving the bacteria to um, produce this, this red colored dye. And then at the end of the experiment, you'd go in and simply pick out the reddest of the colonies over here. Now, if you look closely at this, there's some really, really, really interesting stuff going on, okay? Do you notice how some of these are kind of modeled in appearance? This one has some little red dots and then it looks mainly clear. What's going on there? That's absolutely fascinating, okay? I'd like to know more about that. So the essence of being good scientists is not simply running experiments. The essence of being good scientists is designing good experiments and then observing the results like a hawk Okay, you have to look at these things intensely, intensely, intensely and ask questions. Why is there a white halo around this one and then a red inside? What is different between the bacteria here and the bacteria out here? Maybe it's a trivial reason. Maybe these guys have had more time to produce their lycopene and these guys are just, you know, they, they haven't grown as long on the outside. But you still would want to know that. And so being a scientist is all about designing good experiments and then next, observing, observing, observing. And making those observations, that's where we make progress in science and where we make progress in chemical biology. Okay, sound good? All right. Um, oh, I didn't tell you about the Darwinian evolution. You can imagine getting a bunch of mutants, picking out the winners over here, mutating them again, pick out the winners, mutate again, pick out the winners. That's the same process of evolution that we talked about on Tuesday, where you diversify the pool, select for fitness, keep doing the same thing again and again and again, until eventually you have some super growers, ones that can grow really, really fast under those conditions. Okay, and that would be really interesting to understand at a molecular level what's going on there and what's allowing them to do that. Okay, viruses are very powerful tools for gene delivery. Um, they're very efficient and affecting cells. I'll be showing you an example of viruses in action in just a moment. Um, my laboratory grows large quantities of viruses as a tool for chemical biology. Um, their major goal in life is to make copies of themselves. That's what they do, okay? They have a very short lifetime and during that time they are 
totally fixated on making new copies of themselves. Um, because they have sh such short lifetimes and they're so ruthless at amplifying themselves, this provides a very powerful tool for selections. Okay. Let me show you um, an example of this. The example is using a technique called phage display, um, which again is applied by my, my laboratory and many others. Um, what we do is we start with a filamentous virus. Okay, so each one of these little hairy things over here, each one of these thread-like things is a single virus. And um, the virus, this particular virus, infects E. coli. So like all viruses, the inside of the virus is an encapsulation, it encapsulates um, genetic material. In this case, this virus encapsulates DNA. There's other viruses that are RNA-based. This one happens to be DNA-based. Okay, now here's the great part. As a chemical biologist, we can go in and manipulate the DNA that's found inside the virus. When we do this, we can coax the viruses into producing large numbers of different viruses, each one with a different protein displayed on its outer surface. Okay, each one with a different protein outside on its outside. Okay, that's called displayed. Okay, and then you can do selections. So for example, you have say a billion different viruses, each one with a different protein displayed out here. You can then throw these viruses at a chemically modified surface down here and then simply pick out the winners, the ones that can grab on to this chemical found on the outer surface over here. Everything else that can't grab on is washed away. You wash this away using some sort of buffer. Okay, so you just flow water over, over this for five minutes. I guarantee it to you, everything that's a weak binder, everything that can't really get a good grip on the chemically modified surface gets thrown in the, in the trash. Okay? And then you start amplifying up those winners. And then you do the process again. And then you do the process again and again, like four or five times. By doing that, you start to get very tight binders um, to this chemical found on the surface of your, uh, uh, that you're targeting. Okay, so this is a way of starting with literally 10 billion different molecules and coming down and identifying just a few that do something special, such as bind to this uh, chemical over here. Okay, question over here? Seeing a virus so small, how can you pick out every single virus? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a great question. So how do you even manipulate these viruses? So what we do is we infect back their E. coli hosts and then we can make colonies of those E. coli that are infected where each colony has one and only one type of virus inside of it. Okay, and then you can actually see the virus there. Okay. But uh, after scanning for the uh, virus that can attack to the virus, Yeah, yeah. You infect that virus into the E. coli? Yeah, let me show you on the next slide. Okay, great question. Okay, so um, the question is about the particulars of how this technique works. Again, here's the viruses over here. Um, here's the size of our library. That's around uh, 100 billion or so. That's the maximum size that we can make. Um, notice that this, uh, in this uh, electron micrograph over here, um, there is a little cluster of grapes at one end of the virus. That's its head. That's what it uses to grab on to the E. coli that it's going to infect. Okay, so um, that's this part up here. Okay, that's the head of the virus, that cluster grapes. And again, the DNA is, is, is um, stuffed into a long pipe of virus over here. And the virus is very flexible. Okay, so this virus is like um, a hose in terms of its flexibility. Okay, now um, here's the experiment that I was getting asked about earlier. So what you do is you make your library of different viruses, each one with a different protein displayed out here, and then you throw those viruses at some target, Pac-Man, okay? This Pac-Man shaped target that happens to be stuck on the surface of, uh, on some sort of surface, okay? You then select all of the things that bind to Pac-Man and wash away everything that doesn't bind, okay? So in this step, you go from 100 billion down to just say, let's say, a couple hundred, okay? And, you, and then you pick out these viruses, you amplify them up in their host, E. coli, and then you do this again, okay? So again, we target Pac-Man, wash away the non-binders, amplify up the binders, wash away the non-binders, amplify up the binders, and you just keep doing this a bunch, a bunch of times. 
Okay? At the end of it, you'll end up with, say, let's say 50 to 100 that bind really well to the targeted Pac-Man shaped molecule. Okay, so now you want to go in and you want to look at those individuals and see which one binds the, the best. I think that's your question, right? Okay, so what you do is you infect the winners um, into E. coli. This is a bacteria. And then you, um, you can plate out bacteria such that you end up with colonies. Okay, that was shown over here. Each one of these dots is called a colony. These are genetically identical bacteria. In the case of, uh, of virus infected bacteria, each one of these colonies will have a different virus in it, a different uh, bacteriophage in it. Okay? And then you can assay each one of those individually. Okay. Um, it turns out that this principle of vast libraries of proteins that are displayed on phage is also applicable to DNA and RNA. And this is another tool that's used routinely in chemical biology laboratories. Um, so my colleague, uh, Professor Andre Luptak, for example, routinely makes huge libraries of RNA and then selects for binders from this big library. So um, here, for example, is a derivative of rhodamine, a molecule that I showed you earlier. And here's an RNA for, uh, sequence that likes to bind to this um, rhodamine-like molecule that I showed earlier. So you can select for binders to all kinds of different things from these vast pools of both DNA and RNA. Okay, using exactly the same principle that I showed earlier. You attach this molecule to some surface. You throw at that surface the big pool of, say, RNA. Wash away all the non-binders. Grab onto the binders. Amplify them up. Repeat the process. Okay, so it's simple molecular evolution. Okay, exactly like the evolution that we talked about on Tuesday. Now, the reason why this is important, uh, it's important to apply this evolution, is you cannot know in advance exactly what sequence is best going to bind to some complicated molecule like this. Okay, I know um, it would be really cool if I could sit down with my laptop and, uh, you know, crunch some numbers and at the end of that get the perfect RNA sequence. But um, we chemical biologists can't do that. Okay, we just don't know what are the design rules for designing something uh, that has a pocket shape like this. And furthermore, what are the functionalities that we're going to need that will be complementary to the, po the partial positive charge over here, um, the lone pairs on oxygen, the aromatic over here, et cetera. Um, it's better just to go out and do the experiment and just see what you get and then analyze what, uh, what you get at the end of it. Okay, makes sense? Okay. Um, so um, that was an example in your toolkit of using libraries, both on phage, libraries that are DNA or RNA. Um, the next uh, thing in your toolkit um, are small molecules. So small molecules are used extensively in chemical biology. So some of these molecules are antibiotics. Some of them are natural products that are found um, in, uh, that are being produced by microorganisms as they fight off their invaders. But others are discovered in chemical biology laboratories with a particular function. Okay? And so um, these molecules are used quite extensively both in chemical biology laboratories but also cell biology and biochemistry labs. So for example, um, yesterday I showed you the pathway uh, of the central dogma which is the um, information pathway for biosynthetic information inside the cell. Um, small molecules, such as the one shown over here, are known to inhibit pretty much every step of this pathway. And so um, on the shelf, you can have molecules that would, say, disrupt the process of translation, like cyclohexamide, shown here, um, or other molecules that disrupt transcription, such as this ad uh, amanitine, amanitine, alpha amanitine, shown here. And um, these are molecules that you can buy from your chemical supplier. Okay? So these small molecules give you tools to shut down specific events inside the cell. Okay? Now what's so powerful about this is you can control the dose, the location, the time of delivery, et cetera, with perfect control over those type of things. Okay? The dose is simple. right? You add the exact concentration of the small molecule you want. And um, where this is important is that also controls the percent of inhibition that you're doing. Okay, so let's say you want to shut down a little bit of protein translation, but not all protein translation. Maybe you don't use a huge quantity of cyclohexamide over here. Um, maybe on the, more likely though, you just want to shut down all protein translation. So you add a large concentration of cyclohexamide. 
In addition, you can control the location. So you can deliver the molecule to um, some space, some, uh, let's say you're looking at an organ um, under the microscope and you want to know, uh, you know, what happens if I shut down protein synthesis on uh, this part of the stomach but not this other part over here? You can dose that part of the stomach and then leave the other part undosed. Um, in addition, you can control the time of delivery, delivery, right? You can say, look at, if you're looking at circadian rhythms inside, um, I don't know, inside your neural cells, right? Circadian rhythms are the, the timing of clocks uh, that, uh, that is used by organisms to coordinate their day. Um, you might be really interested in knowing what happens if I shut down um, transcription at, uh, right before the organism goes to sleep. So being able to add the small molecule at a precise time in a precise location um, with a precise concentration is really powerful. And it's one of the reasons why small molecules are so important inside cells, inside uh, chemical biology and cell biology labs. Okay, any questions about what we've seen so far? Okay, I've shown you a whole series of different uh, experiments that you can do and you, should, you can plan to do. Um, I want to show you next uh, the players that you're going to be using for designing your proposal ideas. Okay, you're going to be using uh, model organisms because as I told you earlier, I don't want you to plan experiments on humans. Okay, that would not be the, the point of this uh, course. Okay. Um, instead, what I'd like you to use is um, model organisms or samples that are obtained from consenting human adults. Okay? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, in general though, when you're choosing a model organism, you want to choose one that grows easily, um, uh, that's easy to study, that grows quickly, and has some relevance to human biology. Okay, not every model organism is going to be so great. If, you're, um, if you want to study, say, you know, the hearts of um, Burmese pythons, and Burmese pythons take years to grow or something like that, um, it might be a very long PhD for you or your students, and no one likes that. Okay, so you want to choose organisms that grow quickly, that are inexpensive to grow, um, that don't require really exotic conditions to grow. You know, if, you're, if you have to feed your Burmese pythons rabbits every two weeks or something like that, it's going to be expensive and it's also going to be a lot of hassle. And so you need to have some really good reason to have chosen Burmese pythons as the model system. In general, um, these are the model systems that uh, we uh, use in uh, chemical biology laboratories with the exception of humans down here. I'm just listing this for, for point of comparison. Okay, so we will, I will march, th I will step through each of these and tell you about their properties. Okay, so for example, I've shown you earlier um, use of this bacteriophage. This is a virus that only infects E. coli bacteria, um, hence the name bacteriophage. So it's a virus that eats, phage means to eat, bacteria. And this only affects E. coli. This makes it very convenient for us to use in the laboratory because we don't have to worry about if it uh, escapes, quote unquote escapes. Um, we don't have to worry about it infecting um, my coworkers, the graduate students and postdocs in the lab. Um, furthermore, it has a very simple genome. It just has 11 genes in its genome. That makes it easy to manipulate. Okay, this reference here is to the picture that I'm showing you and I showed earlier in the class. Okay, it's the electron micrograph. Um, in addition, uh, it grows in E. coli. Let me show you what E. coli look like. So here are um, E. coli next to a red blood cell. Let's see, is this right? No, sorry, this is next to a mac macrophage. So these are the, um, the uh, cells in, in your immune system that are charged with eating E. coli, okay, and, or other foreign invaders. Okay, so each E. coli is on the order of about one micro, micrometer in uh, scale and each human cell is on the order of 20 to 30 microns in scale. Okay, so that gives you kind of an idea and I think this picture dramatically illustrates the relative scales. This makes sense, right? E. coli are prokaryotes. I showed you structures of prokaryotes last time. Um, human cells, of course, are eukaryotic cells. Um, they're a lot more complicated. They have a lot more um, organelles inside them, et cetera. Okay, so um, classic experiment in, um, uh, in uh, bio biological history. Um, this was, uh, this is uh, Griffith. Um, at the top, or that's Fred Griffith at the top um, with his dog Bobby. 
I always like to know the names of scientist dogs. Uh, Fred Griffith uh, learned to recognize R uh, pneumococci uh, and differentiate them from S pneumococci. So R equals rough, S equals smooth, and um, he found that uh, dead S pneumococci could uh, transform live R. And um, Avery, this guy down here, um, working at Rockefeller, showed that if you isolate the DNA from the dead S bacteria, it could transform the um, R bacteria into S. Okay, so the important idea there is that it showed us that DNA was the hereditary unit of the cell, that DNA was encoding the machines inside the cell that were making the outer surface either, either smooth or rough. Okay, uh, sad history here. Uh, Fred Griffith died in the, uh, when the Germans were bombing London. He died in the London Blitz. Okay, so um, E. coli, extensively, extensively used. I've shown you a couple of examples, including phage display today. Um, yeast are used as a model system for a very simple um, eukaryote um, as a, you know, equivalent to the prokaryotic e. Uh, e. coli, but very simple to grow, very easy to genetically manipulate, et cetera. Um, as things get more complex, we get towards organisms like fruit flies over here. Um, fruit flies are used extensively uh, in uh, laboratories because they grow quickly and you can do selections for things like um, morphology, shapes of wings and things like that, but then even more complex uh, traits such as behavior. And I will show you one example of this. This is one of my all-time favorite examples. Uh, this is the great uh, Ulrike Haberlein, a professor at UCSF. And um, in this experiment, uh, the Haberlein lab has uh, built an apparatus that they call an, an inebriometer. Okay, so this looks at drunk fruit flies. Okay, so here's the way this works. This bottle over here contains ethanol. And then she pulls a little bit of a vacuum on this so that the vapors come off, or she blows air over the top of this so that vapors of ethanol come off over here. And then she applies a bunch of different fruit fly mutants to the very top of the column. Now when fruit flies land on these cones over here, and the cones are made out of like a little wire, the fruit flies grab onto these things. Okay, that's what fruit flies like to do. They like to perch on things. But now they're being washed over with this ethanol vapor. Okay, so the alcohol is coming over them and they're inhaling it. They can't get away. And so as they start to wobble back and forth, they um, fall down to the next uh, cone and then they grab on again. But then they start wobbling around as they get shrunk from the ethanol and they drop down to the next one until eventually down here, they, they totally pass out. Now, <laughs> the wild type fruit fly over here takes 20 minutes to come through this column. Whereas there are mutants that, uh, that the Haberlein laboratory found that only took 10 to 15 minutes to get through the column. In other words, those were fruit flies that were getting drunk and passing out faster than the other fruit flies. So the chemical biology part of this experiment would be to understand what genes are involved and then at the at level of atoms and bonds, why those genes are making the fruit flies drunk faster. Okay, now I do have one request. Please do not plan your chemical biology proposal using an inebriometer. I have seen every variant of this with marijuana smoke, with uh, all kinds of you know, things that cause all kinds of interesting effects. So use any other experiment. But what I like about this is I love the experimental design. It's very straightforward. Any one of you in this classroom could have invented that. And that's what I'm going to be looking for when I look at your proposals um, later in the quarter. Okay, I'll see you a week from today, back in this lecture hall. We'll be talking about more model systems, and then we'll talk, be talking about aero pushing.